Good morning. I'm Kimberly Phillips Bohm, a proud graduate of Warren College, a proud graduate of the University of California class of 1982. And I'm president of the UC San Diego Alumni Board of Directors. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the latest installment in our Triton's Tackling webinar series. Today, we are tackling the monumental task of bringing our campus back to life and resuming operations via UC San Diego's innovative Return to Learn program. Today, we will hear from this about this program from our Chancellor Pradeep K. Kolsla, as well as the faculty experts leading this effort. And you'll hear from students themselves in conversation with our Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, Allison Satterlund. Our goal today is to inform you of what is happening on campus so you can take pride in the areas in which we are leading and become more aware and involved in supporting our campus, its students and your fellow alumni, especially those who are just starting out on these challenging times. As president of the Alumni Board, it is my privilege um, to represent you, the UC San Diego alumni body, but I also encourage you to be part of the changes happening on campus. Our alumni board has three standing committees open to any alumnus focused on improving the student experience on campus, engaging alumni and advancing philanthropy. Whether it's talking to students about your own experience or helping realize the future of our university, I hope our program today will inspire you to reach out to alumni at UC San Diego EDU to learn more about engaging in these efforts. And now to our program, I'm pleased to present our UC San Diego Chancellor, Pradeep Kolsla. Thank you, Kim, and good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Return to Learn webinar. Uh, let me uh, start by giving you a brief overview of what our program is. Uh, you really don't want to hear from me as much as you want to hear from the experts, but my job is to whet your appetite and just be the warm-up guy. So let me see if I can do my job appropriately. Uh, so Return to Learn is our university-wide strategy to facilitate a safe return to campus uh, for faculty, staff, and alumni. Sorry, faculty, staff, and students, and of course the alumni too. Uh, unfortunately, you won't be here because of COVID-19. Uh, this is a cutting edge program, which actually was conceived by our faculty right here on our campus. And you're gonna hear from some of them. We're gonna to talk to you about uh, how they conceived it and what is it that they uh, created. Uh, it is a combination of cutting edge uh, best practices in epidemiology, public health and technology. Uh, and it is so appropriate that uh, we were the first school or not the first, one of the first schools to announce a complete program um, and given that we have a new school of public health, uh, this made it also very timely uh, and really impactful. Uh, so this is a very cross-functional program, uh, thinking from, like I said, multiple domains, uh, and faculty, students, and staff all had an input into this. Uh, we've been working on this for the last three months now, uh, maybe four months, uh, and we even tested, we even did a small pilot run before uh, we started the move-in process about four days ago. So between March and September, when we started the uh, when we were doing the piloting, we only saw a few uh, positive cases. Most of them from were from out were not on campus; they were in the community. This is not to say that the community is to blame for everything. So please don't get me wrong. I think the point we are trying to make is on campus we are able to control the environment more uh, uh, in a much stronger way than we are in the community. Uh, and our approach has uh, three strategies, three pillars, risk mitigation, viral detection, and intervention. And you, and you will hear about all of them. Uh, you will hear about the practices we're implementing. You will hear the practices that our faculty have helped change, both in the CDC and the WHO. Uh, you will hear about uh, ideas that our faculty have put out there, such as wastewater testing, that we were the first one to put out back in late April, early May. And now it's become more common than you would think. Uh, and we've been one of the first schools to really get this done properly. We've hired uh, about 250 or so health ambassadors. These are students who are out there making sure that everybody, the Tritons are protecting each other. Uh, I can just go down the list. Uh, I can tell you within the UC system, we are one of the larger uh, 
campuses with the, with the return to learn, we will have about 10,500 students on our campus uh, by the time, at the end of September, we'll have 10,500 students. And that is more students on our campus, first of all, number one in the UC system. And secondly, more students than most universities in the country have on their campus uh, right now. So I am excited about what we are doing. I have complete faith in the faculty, staff, and students who are gonna be part of this. Our implementation team is just spectacular. Our management team has been working day and night. Uh, I just, just cannot tell you how excited I am. And I am also excited that you're gonna hear about this. And I hope when you hear about this, you will take pride in the creativity of this place, this place that had a little impact on your life is now having an impact on other people's lives. And now we are being watched by our peers, by other universities in the country, as to what's the right way to uh, restart a campus. So with that said, let me just say welcome one more time. Um, it's unfortunate you will not be on campus, but I cannot wait for this to be over, uh, for us to be successful, and to see you all on campus very soon. Thank you very much. And back to Dr. Kimberly phillips uh your president of the Alumni Association. Kim? Thank you, Chancellor Colsa. Thank you so much. Now we'll turn it over to our panel of medical experts, Drs. Anderson, Schooley, and Martin. I turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Dr. Bohm. It's del I'm delighted to be here with all of you today, and particularly with uh, my colleagues, uh, Drs. Anderson and Martin. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, the Return to Learn program, its genesis, and some of the early experience uh, we've, uh, we've had with it uh, over the course of the last uh, week. Uh, this is a program that really began uh, back last uh, April, uh, the first week in April when it became clear that we were going to have several months of difficulty ahead of us with a rapidly expanding uh, epidemic that um, uh, was uh, beginning to really grip the U.S. and forced uh, almost every college in the U.S. to send students home. And we, as they were leaving, uh, one of the first questions we asked was what we need to do to get them back here. And we didn't really think this epidemic was going to end in a couple of weeks. We felt it was going to be something we we're going to have to adapt to and develop a forward-looking plan. Uh, our inspiration was actually Wayne Gretzky, uh, a great hockey player who was once asked uh, why he was such a great hockey player. And his response was, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where it's going to be. And our program is based really on that concept. We want to know where the virus is going to be and where the disease is going to be, not where it was which is the way the, the uh, disease was initially tracked by trying to look at uh, case counts. We wanted to have one of the most forward-looking uh, integrated programs uh, in the country that would allow us to track the virus, understand its trends, and to be able to get out ahead of it by starting a very comprehensive testing program on the college campus. Uh, this was one that at the time uh, seemed quite radical because tests were difficult to get. They were done in the hospital as a medical test. Uh, and we knew that to try to get to the scale we needed, we needed to develop new approaches uh, to be able to make this something could be done at mass scale. And uh, our program began with this effort. One of the most important aspects of this, however, was uh, not just being able to do the testing, but to better understand how to target it, how often you should do it. And as you hear from Dr. Uh, Dr. Anderson, when you get a positive result, what do you do with that result? Uh, one of the most important parts of our program has been that we've tried very hard to make it rigorous, scientifically based, uh, quantitative, uh, and uh, to have a rigorous um, framework that we can use to guide policy uh, and to readjust our thinking moving ahead. And the architect of that has been Dr. Natasha Martin, a mathematical modeler uh, who uh, is in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health. Uh, that I'd uh, like to turn this over to next to give you uh, an idea about some of the approaches that uh, she has put together uh, to help guide the program. Natasha? Thanks, Dr. Schooley. Good morning, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. So as you've already heard this morning, we have based our Return to Learn program on these three pillars, reducing the risk of transmission on campus, detecting the virus so that we can detect outbreaks early, as well as public health intervention through contact tracing and isolation and other activities. And so what I really wanted to do was, you know, continue this idea that we would have a data-driven adaptive approach to reducing COVID transmission risk on campus. And what that meant is that I, I wanted to be able to integrate the diverse types of information that we receive on a daily basis and integrate that information into a simulation model of COVID transmission. 
So uh, early on, what we did was we developed, um, you know, relatively simple models to say, well, what level of asymptomatic testing would we need in order to detect outbreaks early? And that helped us understand that we wanted to be able to test frequently because many people are um, either wholly asymptomatic or are very transmissible prior to their developing of symptoms. So that really, um, that quantitative work where we were looking at, you know, can we detect outbreaks um, before there are 10 linked viral infections on campus, really drove this idea that we wanted to have this asymptomatic testing program that was you know, easily um, scalable and easy to access for students on campus. And that really drove that pilot activity that you heard about this summer. Subsequently, what we've done is we wanted to develop a, a much more sophisticated model to incorporate all the pillar elements that we were talking about to really look at issues like, what, what impact could structural changes to campus have on transmission, such as reducing the density of classrooms or reducing the density of housing? Um, in addition, we could use that more detailed model to look at things like testing frequency, as well as other activities such as wastewater testing on program, uh, wastewater testing to detect viral activities early. So what we did was we developed a tailored individual based model of COVID transmission across our campus. That model incorporates on-campus, off-campus students, it incorporates faculty and staff and all of their different types of interactions. We actually use actual UCSD data in terms of the residential buildings and how they're configured in terms of suites and different sizes to, to parameterize our model, as well as the actual registration data of students across their courses and how many courses are in person and how many are hybrid. And so using this very detailed and nuanced model that incorporates the kind of real campus transmission networks we have, we're using this to really try to understand and predict where we might see transmission on campus, the relative impact of interventions targeting those different types of transmission risk areas. And then as we move into the quarter and we generate new data in terms of where we actually see transmission on campus, we can iteratively feed it back into that model to predict the impact of tailored intervention strategies. So this model, I think, again, was very helpful in us trying to understand what is the relative benefit of the things that we've done. And we can, we've already seen with the modeling that the changes that have been made on campus, for example, reducing the density of housing to singles and providing a hybrid instructional approach with many classes online and reducing the maximum size of classrooms that are in person, classes in person, has had a substantial impact of reducing the risk of transmission on campus. It, additionally, it allows us, as I mentioned, to detect outbreaks early. And one of the things we realized with the modeling was that one of the um, higher risk areas for a potentially large outbreak are our residences that have higher numbers of students in those residential buildings. So in parallel, we've developed this wastewater monitoring program, which tests the wastewater in a dorm, we may be able, or in a cluster of residences, we may be able to see viral activity in that wastewater, and then that can lead us to do expanded viral testing in the, among those associated residences to pick to detect outbreaks early. So again, we're using this integrative and adaptive system to take the data in, feed it into our simulation models to understand where we see viral transmission on campus, and then predict what the relative impact of our different actions are. I and mean, then I think an important part of this, as Dr. Scully mentioned, is what do we do after we detect these infections on campus? We have this amazing surveillance. We've already done these risk mitigation efforts, but once we've detected an infection, what do we do next? And Dr. Anderson, I'm hoping maybe you can talk a little bit about those activities and what we've set up there. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, and um, good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you this morning. And I can't express enough how impressed I've been as someone who's, you know, has a career devoted to public health, sitting now in the midst of a public health crisis, at the attitude, the aptitude, and the great scholarly um, exchange that I've seen across this campus as we've approached our response to uh, COVID-19. So I want to just pick up where Dr. Martin left off and talk a little bit about what happens when we've done that early detection, right? We've um, raised our testing capacity. We have the ability to understand what's happening in individuals who have symptoms as well as those who are asymptomatic. And then what? 
Well, the first thing we do is we go to some uh, very strong pillars of public health, which is to intervene early and to figure out how we remove individuals from circulating within the general population so that there isn't inadvertent shedding of the virus and then transmission onto others. That happens through a program that you've probably heard of um, in the news called contact tracing. It has three components. Uh, the first is where we do an interview with the person who has tested positive. And that interview allows us to elicit their close contacts. Who have they been around uh, within shorter than a six foot distance for a, a pre-specified period of time? And once we understand who those close contacts are, we also further try to get a handle on is that person at high risk for severe complications of COVID-19? Are they a person that would be a high uh, transmitter of COVID-19? For example, have they been in a congregate setting, a party, a nursing home, um, a facility where it's likely that many people would have um, gotten the disease from being around that person? We also try to understand what their daily lifestyles look like and adapt what we do in their support system, wrap around services to make sure that the isolation that is necessary, again, to prevent that uh, transmission uh, can occur for that person successfully. So that's the first part. We really do a thorough um, interview with the person who has tested positive. Once we know those close contacts, we move to that next stage, uh, which is about interviewing the contact or a contact investigation. And we ask very similar things um, to what I just mentioned in the, in the case interview. However, at this point, we're also thinking about um, the symptoms development for this person because they may be uh, in what, I'll use a technical term here, in an incubation period that requires close monitoring for the development of symptoms, uh, further testing, and also being in quarantine. So now, um, these individuals are asked to also remove themselves from the general population to ensure we don't have inadvertent transmission. We do the same uh, querying about what do you need to do this successfully? And then we follow up with individuals over a 14 day period. Now at UC San Diego, this has been no small feat. When you talk about providing housing for individuals to do this kind of self-isolation, to do quarantining, it also means that we're thinking through, you know, what kinds of errands did they need to run over the next uh, two week period and facilitating uh, helping to make the essential things happen. Um, how do they get their food. How do they think about uh, some of the things that were on their plate work um, and other activities and we're really there um, to manage through uh, those things as well. So it's a, it's a real whole person uh, kind of approach. The other thing that I, I want to say um, in this regard is that, as you've heard from both Dr. Schooley and Martin, um, we've approached this in a really adaptive way. And so what that means is that we pilot tested our approach uh, in the, I guess, late spring. Um, we've been watching and have had the good fortune, actually, of having a later open to our, our school year. We've been watching what's been going on across the country, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, and we've been strengthening our plans accordingly. And a real key about this uh, march toward reopening is to understand what do we monitor uh, every single day. The three of us, along with our two other colleagues, we sit uh, every evening after our workday is complete. And um, I also have to say one of the nice things about that I've learned about this campus is how much fun it is to hang out with your colleagues um, in the midst of, you know, what is arguably one of the worst crises we'll ever, we'll ever see. Um, but we really do um, support each other. We're very collegial. We do it in a way that's scholarly, but we also, um, you know, we have good relationships with each other. And we think about a couple of different aspects. How's the epidemiology going on on the campus? So what do we know about how many new infections we have? Where are those infections occurring? Over what period of time are they occurring? Is it more than we would anticipate? We think about um, the behaviors of our students and our faculty and our staff. Are they consistent with the things that we've asked, being physically distant, wearing masks, uh, staying um, you know, with good hygiene practices throughout the, the suite areas? As Dr. Martin mentioned, we monitor the density on the campus and we think about what's going on in the general community. 
So one of the lessons that we've learned um, in the last three weeks as we've watched other um, campuses reopen is the real challenge of uh, taking great care of our off-campus community of students. Many of you alumni probably remember what it was like to live in the greater San Diego community and balance that to great care and love um, for our off-campus students with our, uh, what we're doing with our on-campus students and having that be a real display of our greater love for the San Diego community. Um, and so we've extended, as Dr. Martin alluded to, a lot of the symptom screening, the testing, the availability of a place to isolate or quarantine to our off-campus um, students as well, because many of you know, uh, often um, how you live when you're in an off-campus setting may not necessarily allow you to successfully quarantine or isolate. So I've just been um, really pleased um, that we've been able to rally and um, make these changes in real time and be here uh, with a program that I think we're all very uh, pleased with and that is working very well, that upholds those key pillars for early detection and um, risk mitigation as well as interventions. And I'll now pass it back to uh, Dr. Schooley to talk a little bit more about what this uh, reopen has looked like uh, because we started welcoming our students back last Saturday. So thanks, uh, both of you. I think that sets a, a good um, uh, framework for what happened on Saturday morning when the students uh, and their families began to arrive on campus. Um, our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and her staff uh, prepared for this very carefully, and uh, as did our laboratories. We wanted to be able to test every student uh, as they arrived to make uh, to understand what the prevalence of, uh, of virus was among the student body as they returned. Uh, these Numbers in other campuses have ranged for as high as one and a half percent at West Point uh, to as low as 0.5% uh, uh, at UC Merced and 0.3% at UC Berkeley, both of which were um, semester schools and had a little bit of a head start on us. Uh, we have been scaling up our ability to do uh, uh, viral testing all spring and summer. And so at this point, uh, we are poised to be able to do about 12,000 tests a day. Uh, up from about 20 a day uh, as recently as uh, mid-March. Uh, and with this increased volume, uh, based on Dr. Uh, Martin's modeling, our current plan is to be able to test everybody uh, a couple times a month and certain populations more frequently uh, if we identify uh, areas of greater risk. But this allowed us to be able to test everyone coming in uh, and to retest them within two weeks. And we spread out arrivals so we'd be able to have uh, between four and 800 students arrive a day. Uh, and have their orientation and testing done. Uh, and uh, this began to happen on, um, on um, Saturday morning. Uh, we uh, have it set up uh, in our uh, hospital laboratory under Dr. David Pride's direction so that we get results uh, as fast as six hours, but all of them with, uh, uh, by the following morning. Uh, we've now tested uh, 2,278 students um, and uh, we're going to have a sweepstakes here. I, there's a question and answer period here, a question and answer uh, panel on the right. And the person who gets uh, the correct number of positive students out of this 2200 that I mentioned uh, will uh, be given a, a scholarship uh, to return to campus uh, as a freshman and, and uh, re-enjoy uh, your four years at UC San Diego. So we're going to leave the question and answer block open for about two minutes and allow those of you who want to join the sweepstakes. Uh, these are price is right rules. So if you go over the number, you're disqualified. If you get the number, you're in good company. And if you go under the number, you have a chance to win. So please use the question and answer uh, panel uh, to uh, get to how many you think are positive so far uh, out of 2,200. Um, there have been some questions uh, coming into the um, into the uh, question and answer box that we'll try to get to uh, right now. Uh, one of them I, I answered uh, in uh, uh, writing, but I think is important to uh, also talk a bit about it was, we, we see a lot of uh, governments uh, having triggers that if we have X number of cases uh, in a week, we'll close down the uh, hospital or the, uh, the um, automobile body shops. Uh, and uh, the question was, what are our triggers here on campus? Uh, the approach we've taken is really a multi-parameter um, uh, approach in which we're looking at many different sets of data that help us understand uh, 
proactively where the pressures are coming from so we can again take proactive steps to go after things that we think are um, are in the way of are driving uh, any increased viral activity and this lets us uh, do things that are specific for the um, for the increased number of cases we've seen campuses have uh, a large number of cases because students are having parties off campus react by telling students not to come to physics class. Uh, and our approach is designed to try to intervene in areas that are uh, directly uh, driving the epidemic, which is why we try to follow such a rich uh, data stream. Uh, when people, uh, there's also a question about air handling systems. Uh, we have uh, really very good engineers. The Scripps Institute of Oceanography has a tremendous group of people uh, with uh, aerosol science uh, in, as their background and all of the dorms have been set up so air is not recirculated in the dorms. Uh, that's one of the pillars of this, uh, of this, mis of this risk mitigation. Um, what are we doing in terms of uh, the testing method uh, right now? Uh, it's PCR of nasal swabs. Uh, we'll be moving to saliva, uh, self-collected saliva before too long. Uh, test results are coming back within uh, four to 18 hours, uh, which allows Dr. Uh, Anderson's team uh, to get on things quite quickly. Uh, we're still not seeing any, any, any numbers come in here, or are we? Let's see, yes, we are. Okay, good, all right. Good numbers here. Uh, so uh, we, just to, um, uh, just to uh, begin to help those of you who haven't voted yet, I actually only see one answer here uh, that's going to have any chance of being uh, of winning under the prices right rules so uh, those of you who might want to scan this and um, two answers perhaps uh, and get in a, another round of, of answers and then uh, we'll let uh, dr martin um, tell you how many people dr uh, anderson's team is is uh, trying to uh, uh, to follow um, thank you, Dr. Schooley. I'm going to, um, we have plenty of time for questions right now. And so I'm going to um, um, ask some that have come in and um, to have you and Dr. Martin and Dr. Anderson um, respond in turn. So thank you very much. This was fascinating. Um, and I think it, I, I think the most fascinating, of course, for me as an alumna is, you know, seeing the university do what it is so strong in, and that is the integrated, interdisciplinary, and in, in a uh, uh, collaborative approach to handling um, a crisis and leading. So thank you so much. Um, let me ask you, and I think you can go to any one of you, um, is the testing and tracking protocol that UC San Diego is doing possible to implement in other places out in the community? Uh, Dr. Martin can talk a little bit about the local school system. She's been working, uh, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, one of the K through 12 systems you're working with, Natasha? Yes, and I think that was actually one of the questions too that came in, so great way of bringing those together. Sure, yeah, so I saw there was a question about our, um, the advisory relationship that some of us have had at UCSD with San Diego Unified. We're actually working with a number of school districts um, uh, in the San Diego County to provide uh, advisory support and consulting to them. So there was a, a panel of experts that was convened for San Diego Unified just to provide um, feedback and comment on their reopening plans in terms of ventilation and structural considerations as well as reopening triggers. Um, and so there was a, there was a variety of experts um, feeding into that. We're also working with uh, a few school districts uh, looking at um, testing. Um, Solana Beach uh, School District has actually um, implemented an entry testing program. They've test provided testing for their students on entry as well as periodic ongoing testing. And I've been um, working with them developing models to try to understand the impact of various testing um, frequency on reducing the risk of transmission on campus. And so again, kind of trying to understand the relative benefits of, of different testing strategies. Uh, our labs are working with these, uh, with these school districts to try to understand feasibility and to provide support in terms of testing and testing capacity. As you've already heard, we ha have very good turnaround times with our labs and we're expanding. We have quite a lot of capacity. So hopefully that is a good partnership with the school districts. Um, in terms of, there were some questions about th this, you know, expectations of time 
timelines for reopening. And I would just emphasize what you've already heard today. On the UCSD campus, we monitor the data every day. We're monitoring all kinds of different data streams and not just the actual numbers of what's coming in in terms of cases, percent positivity, um, what's going on in the community, but those trends and seeing the direction of those trends. And even if the number isn't itself concerning, is the trend going in the right or the wrong direction? And I think the school districts are doing the same thing. Last week was just an example of where we were potentially um, going to have to go into the tier one um, grading in, as a county level into that purple zone. We did not. We stayed just below for our case rate to that number to remain in the tier two red. And so, you know, these are things that are changing on a daily basis and we're trying to monitor the situation in the community and how that affects um, our ability to uh, respond on campus and whether we need to adapt accordingly. I think the elementary schools are doing the same thing. So this is a very fluid situation and it's hard to, you know, predict exactly what's going to happen. And I think it is the right thing to do to be continually monitoring all of the information um, that's coming in on a daily basis to assess, assess what the appropriate action is at that time. And Kim, I would add here um, that in addition to the, you know, sort of sharing of our information and how that has benefited some of the K through 12 programs, we've also had a faculty member um, who has, who's working with daycares, daycare facilities across the county, um, and that is built off of the wastewater monitoring program that, you know, we started on the campus. And, you know, the crux of your question was, you know, is this pioneering work that we're doing at UC San Diego applicable, generalizable? Can it be you know, transportable to other campuses and settings? And the answer is for sure, yes. And you know, here is, I think, where it's really worth acknowledging our Chancellor Kosla, our EBC Simmons, um, and the leadership of this uh, great university, because having that uh, attitude of let's do this, um, go forth and do what you need, we will support you resource-wise to get this done, was really key because we jumped out of the gates uh, so fast that we really do have um, that kind of program that has been um, really at the leading edge of, of, of a lot of the response to, to COVID-19 for a campus setting. And so we've been, I think, happily you know, sharing everything we have um, with anyone who calls uh, because that is the whole point of, of what we do. It's to, to do it well and to ensure that it serves the greater good for the communities around us. Thank you. How are the UC San Diego Health and our research teams involved in any additional work around COVID-19, especially vaccine research? Well, we have uh, three of the uh, large vaccine studies um, uh, allocated to UC San Diego. Uh, the um, uh, the ones that you've been hearing about uh, nationally are going to be here. Uh, one, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, the um, Janssen vaccine, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, are two of the three. And uh, they're being set up uh, to uh, down on the Hillcrest campus uh, and uh, also uh, looking into high-risk communities so that we can try to understand their immunogenicity in these areas. Uh, there's also... Um, Quite a bit of work going on with uh, antiviral drugs, the Rendezivir study that you saw in the New England Journal of Medicine and the demonstrated uh, accelerated recovery uh, was, uh, UC San Diego was a major part of that. Uh, a second follow-up study uh, of that drug plus uh, another drug called baricitinib uh, is uh, just been finished. And you'll see that in the New England Journal uh, in about uh, 10 days as well. So we've been very heavily involved in, um, in the drug research uh, and in vaccine research. We also have a number of laboratories on campus that are developing new drugs, uh, oral drugs, uh, and things that we think will uh, move the, the ball further down the hill. So we, our campus um, uh, scientists have been very heavily involved uh, in, this, uh, in this outbreak. Our hospital laboratory has also been really at the cutting edge uh, and uh, has been uh, out front of a lot of problem, a lot of hospital laboratories that uh, tied all of their testing into a single platform and found themselves running out of supplies. Dr. Pride was um, was um, had enough foresight to set up five different platforms, so he always has things, uh, at least uh, four of them running, and we haven't had any uh, problems uh, with uh, shortage of testing for our patients or for our students uh, uh, since early in the epidemic. 
So we've been very lucky to have the health center and the campus laboratories present. We actually have now both a laboratory on the campus uh, that is doing state-of-the-art saliva testing and the hospital laboratory that's doing nasal testing to help us with UC San Diego testing and also some of the testing you've heard about from Dr. Martin uh, around the community. Yeah, and I would, I would add here um, just a little bit more about the public health research that has been happening uh, in response. Um, you know, in addition to the daycare um, research that I mentioned earlier, we've also had um, members of our healthcare system go down to Tijuana, uh, work in Mexicali to share best practices for how to set up uh, hospital systems um, in response to COVID-19. Um, we've had a, a program that we've incorporated into a cohort of 120,000 plus uh, women in California called the California Teacher Study. They've been followed uh, since the early 90s and we have uh, sent them uh, kits to better understand what risk factors are and will be important for seroconversion um, in COVID-19 and that we got off the ground um, really in the first few weeks um, of knowing that this pandemic was upon us. Um, we also have, um, as, as uh, Dr. Schooley mentioned, you know, quite a bit going on with regards to, to testing and um, understanding the impacts of uh, what was going on from an equity perspective in our town, um, largely resulted through some of our public health faculty, um, understanding the inequities, uh, really advocating strongly with the county and putting together interventions that resulted in testing um, priorities, prioritization for our communities in, in greatest need. Thank you so much. I have um, a couple of questions still around um, research and the impact of the flu, and then we'll turn our attention to some questions about students. Um, first, how do you see the coming flu season impacting the pandemic? That's a great question, and one of the things that uh, I think is going to be very interesting. Um, we have been pushing very hard influenza vaccines for years, and we're doing it this year in particular because there are concerns that if both viruses are circulating, it'll increase the level of noise around people having symptoms about whether they've got COVID or influenza. Uh, the, there are differences in groups of patients with the two viruses, but an individual patient is sometimes hard to tell, and you end up having to test for both viruses. Having shed, said that, what we saw last spring was when people began to socially distance, put on masks, the flu epidemics ended, uh, dropped like a rock. Uh, and that's happened in the summer, both in Brazil uh, and in Australia, where the viruses circulate in their winter or summer. So we may find ourselves paradoxically uh, having very mild influenza uh, seasons this year because uh, we're going to be wearing masks and distanced uh, from the standpoint of COVID for some time. Now, I don't want that to be a reason for you know, not to go out and get vaccinated. Every, all of us should get vaccinated, but I'm saying that I think it may be a very unusual uh, experience for us this year because it's the first year, I think, in the history of the world that so many of us have uh, entered flu season uh, with a mask on uh, and, uh, and, and not uh, mingling like we normally do when we come inside. And then the, the last question um, before we turn to uh, students in the pandemic, um, what are the latest understandings about COVID-19 and how to treat it? Well, most people recover uh, without actually, to, to be honest, uh, depending on the patient population or the infected population, you could say most people don't aren't aware they're infected. So uh, particularly younger people, over half the infections are asymptomatic or don't get to medical attention, which is one of the reasons it's been able to spread so rapidly. Having said that, uh, those who become ill, uh, there are uh, a group of people who do very poorly and end up with respiratory failure and can die. And this is enriched uh, in, by people who are older, and by that I mean over the age of 50 or 55, and people with what are euphemistically called underlying conditions, which include things as benign as hypertension, but include things like uh, renal dysfunction, uh, liver disease, um, uh, hypertension, uh, the, the sorts of things you accumulate as you get older. Uh, that led to some, I think, denial on the part of younger people uh, about, uh, gee, I don't have to worry about getting COVID. I won't get sick. Uh, I'm just going to go out uh, and um, do, live my life the way I want to. And the two problems with that are that some of them actually do get sick. 
Uh, and the second uh, part of it is they uh, are prolonging the epidemic and they're helping get their parents and grandparents in, in the hospital and the ICU. And thirdly, from the societal perspective, uh, as long as the virus is circulating, it doesn't matter who it's circulating among, we're not going to be able to get back to business and back to school the way we need to, uh, to be able to have the kind of productive society that the U.S. and the rest of the world has had. So it's not benign to have the virus circulating among people who themselves don't get sick as often as the rest of us. And the final thing, final thing I would say is one of the other myths is that uh, uh, that you often hear, particularly among young people, I'm just going to go out and get it now so I get it over with and I don't have to worry about it later. Kind of the chicken pox party concept. The difference between this virus and chicken pox is that with chicken pox, you uh, develop immunity for life. With this virus, your immunity may not, may not last but for several months. We're already seeing people who were infected in the spring getting reinfected with new strains of virus. That's what we see with coronaviruses. And so there is no uh, benefit to running out and getting infected so you don't have to worry about it. You actually do have to worry about it again. Thank you. Um, with um, these, um, this knowledge in mind, what about students who are going off campus? Uh, how um, far does contact tracing go um, off campus into the community? And what about students moving into the com communities? For example, going um, in crowds to restaurants and the like throughout San Diego. Yeah, I think I'll start here. Um, one of the uh, things that I didn't mention that UC San Diego um, has been doing is a partnership with the county uh, to do contact tracing for 18 to 24 year olds in our um, San Diego region. And so we have a, a well-oiled uh, process um, that we use uh, for that category of, of, of age groups. And that is likely to capture you know, any of our students or students from around um, the region uh, who would need to get contact uh, tracing. And so it goes extensively. It captures everyone that's named um, as a close contact. We don't, uh, we don't limit it only to you know, the people who are, are enrolled as our students. So that's, that's, that's the first. And then with regards to people falling outside of those age ranges who may uh, be related to someone who has a positive test result, um, the county has a really um, newly grown and um, re recently very well developed uh, contact tracing team uh, for which they're able to get in touch with people to let them know something might be brewing or at least attempt to get in touch with them. Um, mostly 98% of them in 24 hours and within a 48 hour period, they've usually uh, had a talk with people to let them know that it's important to again, remove yourself from general population uh, activities. Then with regards to uh, how student, the decisions that students may be making uh, to go out into general population activities for gatherings or dinners or socializing, et cetera. You know, this is a message that uh, we've tried to uh, be effective in, uh, in how we deliver it, to be compassionate in how we deliver it, to really think about how we support people in uh, making the right decisions. And so, um, you know, we see our county having public health borders that really push us towards safely living alongside COVID-19. Uh, so being outdoors uh, versus being indoors, being six feet apart at least, um, and having our faces covered. Uh, and we, uh, while we try to, you know, have the county guide us toward those safer activities, know that there will be times when people may be tempted to do uh, things otherwise. And so we reiterate um, those messages and try, we're trying also on the campus to provide alternatives um, that allow people to not feel like they have to abstain from social life, um, but that they have a way to be together and to be together safely. So when it comes to um, what you may be seeing people do in the community, I think that the onus you know, continues to be on us to have a very strong um, campaign, public um, service messaging campaign that reminds people we're all in this together. Um, small actions that we do individually have tremendous population health impacts. It's the crux of public health. And um, we 
you also need to you know facilitate actually give them options uh, for things that that they can do and do safely key is keep your face covered um you know really um wearing a mask that the data shows us um, it works and uh, being physically distant as well as proper hygiene the basics keep them keep them in mind and thank you. I just oh, you could, I'm sorry, Dr. Martin, go ahead. No, I just wanted to add one additional piece of information. So in addition to the sort of traditional contact tracing efforts that Dr. Anderson mentioned in the community, we've also just launched this new um, digital exposure notification application on campus. What that is, is UCSD is a pilot site for the Apple Google digital exposure notification app. Um, UCS, members of the UCSD community can download it on their phone and it can, can provide information on whether using the strength of a Bluetooth signal and whether you've been in contact with other uh, Bluetooth devices recently can give you a ping if somebody that you were in contact with was diagnosed with COVID. Um, it's totally anonymous. You do not know who that person is, but it just gives you a sense of whether you may have been in close contact with a, an individual that was diagnosed positive. We are learning about this technology, but I think this uh, digital exposure notification may, you know, help us identify potential risk and do kind of augment the traditional contact tracing efforts uh, that we're doing on the ground. Um, and finally, one of the other things we're trying to do totally separately to this is that UCSD has a fantastic um, application on, on, on mobile phones, and that application can already give community members information um, about, for example, where the nearest parking space is and how full the library is. And we're trying to use that information in terms of density on campus and, and um, potential contacts uh, of community members, uh, UCSD community members on and off campus to give that information back so that students can make informed decisions about, for example, where they're gonna go on campus or if there are places either on and off campus where we see clusters of activity and where they can avoid that um, activity so that they can keep themselves safe. So I think there's a lot we're trying to do um, augmenting those traditional methods to try to identify off campus risk and, and mitigate that. Thank you. Dr. Schooley, would you um, uh, please uh, speak about um, the number of cases that have actually appeared on campus and how is that information going to get out? In other words, will there be transparency to um, community members about, about positive cases on campus? Before I answer that question, let me let uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Uh, Anderson simultaneously uh, without unmuting divulge the number of cases that uh, were found at move-in. All right, there we go. So, uh, so far we've had two cases out of 2,270, which we think is terrific and really appreciate all the work that the families and students did to get us there. Uh, as to the um, number on campus up to now, Dr. Uh, Martin is uh, developing um, a, um, is enhancing the website that has been out there. We spent a good bit of time on it last night together. And I think what you're gonna see is a much more uh, granular website that shows you not just the cumulative number of cases, which we've been posting for some time, uh, but daily cases uh, broken down by uh, on-campus students, off-campus students, faculty, uh, or, or when I say fa faculty and staff, uh, health employees, uh, you'll be able to know how many people are screening positive up on the symptom screener. Uh, and it'll be very easy to track activity on campus. Um, we've been uh, working on getting the data streams to transfer the data from the um, testing platforms uh, to um, the um, to the uh, to website to develop a Tableau uh, reporter over the last few weeks and it's just taken a while to get that done but uh, uh, it, it won't be a mystery. That's right. And just to add a little bit more information. So as of yesterday, um, we, among students, for example, since, since the beginning of testing, we had, we had um, identified 71 students with infection. Actually, the vast majority of those were off-campus students. Um, and also the majority of those infections kind of occurred in the July uh, time period where we saw quite a lot of activity um, uh, transmission in the community as well. So when you look recently, recently the numbers among students have been very low and as as Chip mentioned, we've only seen two students among the, the move-in which started on Saturday. So uh, we're, we continue to monitor those trends, but I uh, we're very encouraged by the recent activity that we've seen. 
Thank you, Dr. Schooley, Martin, and Anderson. This was really fantastic. And uh, I, there are so many questions and we could keep talking, I think. <laughs> um, just so much information packed in these past few minutes. This came in from someone in the audience. Um, I just want to thank the panel. I feel proud to be in, on this campus with a rigorous and well thought out plan. So I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for your information and your time uh, this afternoon, well, this morning. So thank you. Dr. Thank Bain, you. Dr. Bain, can I just uh, address one question that came in just at the very last minute, which I think is really critical, uh, which is really the why now question. Why didn't we just leave the campus closed and wait until wintertime? The reason for that is this is not going to end anytime soon. Uh, vaccines are being developed, but even with the vaccine, uh, even if it were really much better than we think the first ones are going to be, it's going to be leaky. We're going to have to learn how to operate the campus and our society with this virus looking over our shoulder. Uh, we think the campus, or the educational experience, including the research engagement, is much better with people working together and being on campus together. We think that students gain a lot by their uh, off, uh, by being away from uh, their families and learn to interact with peers, a diverse group of people, much more diverse than you do in your own neighborhoods. There are all kinds of reasons to have colleges operating. And uh, we're doing this because we want to learn how to operate UC San Diego in a cutting edge and the safest way possible, because we're going to have to do this going forward. And we think we've made a great head start with Return to Learn with all the work you've heard about today. So I wish we could say it's going to be over in December. and. Um, Life is good, but we really think we need to learn how to do this, and I think this is going to get us there. Thank you, Dr. Schooling. As a historian and somebody who paid attention to the history of diseases, I think this is an excellent transition to speaking to um, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Allison Satterlund, um, and to students, um, Delaney Wittet and Gabe Avalon. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to come back. I think there's more to say about how um, we live in communities and how we move forward in society. So I would like to turn it over to um, VCSA Sutherland. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I wanna thank um, you, uh, Kim, for hosting us and um, all of our good colleagues and of course um, our alums and um, most importantly, I appreciate the participation of our scholar athletes too. You all will have the opportunity to meet in a moment. So one of the things we, we wanted to share was um, in the midst of COVID-19 uh, and amidst the, the pandemic, uh, UC San Diego proudly continued to move towards achieving Division I status and our scholar athletes continue to do the great work of um, being scholars and conditioning for their sport and contributing to the community in many ways. And we're all here for our students and wanted to make sure that uh, there was time for us to celebrate some of their good work and uh, connect with them. I know also it was important to share some of the work that we've been doing in support of uh, our scholar athletes and our, our non-scholar athletes during the remote uh, student experience. And so in addition to utilizing our fantastic resources that are available to us through UC San Diego Health Telemedicine to provide counseling and psychological services and, and support groups and uh, continue to provide great physical uh, health uh, resources. We also have moved a number of our sociocultural and academic support efforts remotely. Our students have been able to engage with academic support through the Commons, through OASIS, through our success coaching programs. Um, academic advising is also uh, available uh, virtually and our colleges and our graduate uh, division services have also been moved uh, remotely so we have a combination now as we move into return to learn of in-person services uh, that are complementary to the number of students we have on campus so we're uh, providing service somewhere between eight um, hours and 25 hours a week uh, in person staffing for our students who are living on campus or will be coming to campus from off-campus neighborhoods. And then we also did some uh, work with our recreation program, which has just been awesome. It's called the Playground, and you can um, uh, join us for uh, Zumba by Zoom. You can join us for uh, yoga in your living room. Our Playground uh, also includes activities for small kiddos because we have a, a number of folks who've been working remotely and been able to connect their kids to our virtual recreation um, efforts and we also created a virtual student union where we have hundreds of virtual activities that are available for our students to to be in community to share ideas to continue to learn 
for our clubs to meet virtually. And we're continuing, as uh, Dr. Schooley mentioned, to adapt uh, in a way to serve our students because they are the focus of our mission. And, and that's part of why we're so excited to have our scholar athletes, uh, Delaney Wittet and Gabe Avilian with us today. Um, I have some questions I'm going to ask them, and then we're really delighted to also uh, connect with you by uh, Q&A um, afterwards. So Delaney and Gabe, are you ready to get started? Yes, definitely. Sure. Yep. All right, let's do this. Okay, so we know that athletics is much more than competition and that sometimes our scholar athletes might get pigeonholed into certain, certain stereotypes. And one of the things we're excited about sharing today is how much is happening off the field. So talk to us a little bit about how you both have been staying connected to campus and your teams during COVID-19. And Delaney, why don't we start with you? Hi everyone, um, I'm Delaney. And one way that my team has been really working to stay involved off campus is we have a really great alumni base. Obviously we have all of you and then um, our soccer alumni base is pretty big too. So our coach has set up um, alumni pen pals and so she was also a player um, on the women's soccer team so she knows us all pretty well and a lot of the alumni well so she went through and personally chose alumni for to reach out to us um, and then we've been contacting them through email I had a zoom call with my alumni she's in Colorado um, and they come to all our games but it's just so great to have that one-on-one -on -one connection and really get to hear a little extra from them and then kind of going the other direction um, I'm not an alumni yet but there's a lot of young club teams that my coaches coach um, so I was able to jump on zoom with some of the 12 and 13 year olds and talk to them because they'd been having um, zoom trainings as well um, which we did during the spring so that was kind of cool to just get to talk to other young girls and hear what they'd been going through and kind of provide some encouragement and also that was pretty encouraging to me as well so thanks Delaney how about you Gabe um well I, I think our team has kind of been taking a little bit of a different approach than Delaney's partially just because it has been challenging trying to coordinate a whole big group of guys across the country in different time zones and staying connected but um, similarly, we've been doing Zoom meetings and trying to sort of on these Zoom meetings have different topics to keep things engaging, make sure everybody is supported and kind of doing okay through these times. There's a lot going on. And so we have been having conversations sometimes with a specific focus, like talking about, for example, the, the protests and the COVID and different things and other times just checking in on how's family, how's life and um, how are you getting by? And so little things like that is sort of what we've been up to. Well, thank you both for that. So I know that it must have been disappointing to have been prepared to move into Division One in person, that these are your senior years in terms of your, your sports of choice. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your expectations and hopes for the upcoming academic year? Gabe, why don't you start? Sure. Um, yeah, so obviously this year is going to be, I think, still a really important year for UC San Diego. We're moving into the Division I Big West Conference, and this has been something that's been a long time coming. I think everybody in the athletic department is just thrilled to be joining such a really standout league. And in a lot of ways, I think we are still trying to kind of maintain this excitement. Well, we don't know exactly what the competition schedule is going to look like, and we're still figuring out nearly every detail of training and sort of adapting as things develop in the community. I think that we're really ambitious in our hopes for the years. We want to still have this be a year where the UC San Diego Triton community can be inclusive and uh, a thriving and noteworthy presence on the community and are on the campus and kind of still help to serve as that, uh, that, that pillar of like the, the university and kind of a way to bring people together and serve as a, a unifying presence in that way. So we're trying to make the best of the situation, but not lower our expectations in any ways. We're just trying to adjust and still make the best of it. I um, completely agree with everything that Gabe said, and there's definitely a lot of uncertainty. And um, it's it's been a difficult time just because there's constant changes and obviously safety and health is the biggest priority. So um, I think there's full understanding on our team about that. and. Um, but with that said, it's just knowing that um, 
you know, things are going to get better and we're just kind of going with um, what's been happening. And I had an opportunity to talk to some of our incoming freshmen that are going to be on the team and kind of check in about their mindsets. And it's really just great to see them. Like I asked them how they were doing with all the changes because um, our season's been pushed back a bit and they just said they're still so excited to be here and whatever's offered to us, we're going to make the most of it. And on top of that, just our team of athletic trainers and everyone is working so hard with COVID screening and making sure that they're doing injury prevention and just everything. Everyone's really coming together around it to try and make it a safe environment. And I think that's really encouraging and um, something that is really great. So Delaney and Gabe related, how, how does conditioning look in this environment? Um, so for us, it was pretty interesting during spring because um, for soccer, we were kind of operating on the mindset that we might have a fall season. Um, so we had uh, Zoom trainings. So me and our two other captains, we would lead um, body weight trainings over Zoom. Um, and then we had a pretty strict um, packet schedule that our team, um, we couldn't really have communication with our coaches and um, our communication about what we should be doing, but something that's really huge on our team is just um, doing the right thing when you aren't told. So it was a lot of just self um, desire pretty much. So we had a running packet with recommendations, but we were kind of adjusting that um, based on what people had access to. So everyone was kind of on their own, but we were really coming together around that. And now looking to come back, um, we're being tested every week and masks are gonna be worn throughout practice and practices will be distanced. Um, but before we can even start practicing, we have to pass a lot of movement competency tests. Um, and those are one-on-one -on -one sessions with our trainers, um, blood pressure tests, antibody tests. So just a lot of testing before we get to that distanced and mask wearing practices. Yeah, and I can speak to even like right now, we've actually just started this week, the first rounds of um, strength classes at UCSD. So for the athletes that are coming back, this is like the first go around for most of the UCSD athletes to kind of get back into training. And it's um, what it looks like is, is um, all of it outside, distanced and plenty of room, everybody in a mask. And they've, the, the strength conditioning program's done a great job of making sure that like, it is exceedingly safe and that everybody's still able to get a good workout. And importantly, everybody's also now back together in training, which is really a nice thing to have for the mental well-being of everybody too. We saw some of that appreciation for being back on campus during move-in. You know, folks are really uh, excited and willing to uh, be in compliance with the best or uh, better practices for health and well-being uh, for that reason, to be able to be together. So thanks for sharing that with us. So Delaney, you know, you were a reader during spring 2020. So you had some experience on of sort of being a, uh, on the teaching end of the transition to remote learning. Can you talk to us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I think that was a really important side for me to see because going into spring quarter as a student, um, there's a lot of stress and uncertainty about what it was gonna look like to be completely online. Um, but as a reader, I was also in, communication um, with my professor leading up to the start of school and it was just really inspiring to watch how much he cared and what lengths he was willing to go to to make sure that um, students were comfortable so one thing he really was thinking through before we started spring quarter was if it was going to be required for students to have their videos on because there's a side of it where you know you're so much more engaged when you have a camera on you and you're held more accountable but at the same time if that doesn't make students comfortable or you don't know their home situation how can you ask them to be put in that situation and just like how much thought went into that and then other parts of it I mean he was great he was playing his guitar over zoom for students just it was so great to see how much our professors care and I know that's completely widespread across campus just how much they're willing to do for their students um, and athletics, we've always been super appreciative of that because we are constantly needing accommodations for games and scheduling. So they've always been great. And then knowing they're just great in all avenues for all students and looking out for us is 
really, really awesome. Delaney, I appreciated this point that you made so much in part because we, we haven't spent as much time thinking about our faculty also transition to remote learning and it was a, a swift change for many of them too. So, so thank you for highlighting that for us. Now, Gabe, you serve as the president of the Triton uh, Athletic Council. Uh, talk to us about as the president, what's your highest priority this year? I think the, the highest priority this year is really focusing on all of the student athletes as students and then people first, like recognizing that this is uh, a lot that we're asking of student athletes to come back and the, the demands that we're all facing right now are, are, are a lot. And we want to make sure that student athletes are supported um, both with their academics, but also in their personal lives. We've always made um, mental health a really big focus on TAC and uh, through the athletics department is just trying to hone in something that's really important. It's just as important as your your physical health and we get lots of treatment for that. And so we're trying to make sure that especially in this online format, students are still feeling supported and like they have the resources they need to be successful. And one of the other things we do on the Train Athletes Council TAC is um, providing opportunities for um, you know, resources, internships, tutoring workshops, things like that to help student athletes make sure they're still staying on track academically and professionally. And we're trying to make sure we're not backing off that at all, because even though the circumstances have changed, the, the goals are still the same that we want to have all of our scholar athletes graduate and be even, even more successful and prepared for entry into the real world. But so I think the support is probably the biggest, the biggest priority this year. So Gabe, as a follow-up to that, how can alums help you with this really important goal? That's a good question. I think, um, I think it's nice having the ability to reach out to alumni from your own team. You kind of have that ingrained network already, like Delaney said, on, on her team. And that's something we've done with our team as well a little bit, is reach out to alumni and just kind of hearing we had one meeting where we had alumni come in from a team, I think it was 30 years ago, maybe they, they played here. And so they were, they were more than happy to share advice and thoughts and um, answer any questions we had about what life is like after graduation. And similarly, there's a number of programs through the university um, that allow for partnerships between athletes and students in general as well. And, um, and alumni for networking purposes and trying to seek out careers and internships. And um, I think that like, if you are an alumni who wants to get involved, just reaching out to the coaches or people in the department, I know that most of the time they're very receptive to trying to form connections and um, you know, finding these opportunities for collaboration whenever they're available. So that's probably what I would suggest. But I think maybe someone from the alumni department might have a better answer than I do on that. Gabe, it was a great answer because it was uh, uh, an authentic answer from um, a student leader. So we really appreciate that. So this is my last question to the both of you before we move into the uh, Q&A part of our time together with our alums. So we know that being a scholar athlete is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, about more than the competition. How are scholar athletes making a difference off the field? I can speak to two things that are really kind of front and center and what the Trade Athletes Council and the rest of the department has been working on lately that I think answer this question um, perfectly. And so one of the projects TAC has been working on a lot lately is something called the Triton Voting Initiative. And this is something that is sort of the, the brainchild of the department and the, the council that has the stated goal of getting every student athlete registered to vote. And we're trying to do this with the intention to also have a page on the UCSD website full of educational resources and information about um, what's going to be on the ballot, how to ensure your ballot is counted, common mistakes, and ensuring that all of our student athletes are able to be engaged citizens, I think is something we all agreed is really important. It's not a political thing. It is purely just about being involved in your community and you know, having a say in these really important issues. And so that's something we're passionate about and have been working really hard on lately. And then Similarly, there's another pretty important initiative we've been involved with, which is sort of this renewed commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. This has always been um, 
uh, a pillar of, I think, UC San Diego athletics since we've joined and, and been around and always, but this year especially, I think there's been a renewed commitment to it. And our athletic director, Earl Edwards, is actually the chair of this new formed committee in the Big West Conference. It's called Big West Undivided. And maybe Delaney can say something about it as well, because there's actually a teammate from um, one of her teammates is on this committee that is intended to be a standing committee. It's not going to go away. It will exist for the foreseeable future in the Big West and continue to kind of help further conversations about these really important social justice issues and um, being actively anti-racist in our athletic department and our communities as well. Yeah, and going off um, what Gabe said, so even before the Undivided Committee, um, Earl Edwards did a great job and we had two town halls relating to it um, where student athletes were able to speak um, and we had great representation from all teams. Um, and yeah, Marissa Ray is um, a player on my team and she's going to be our representative um, in the Big West um, for the Undivided Committee. And she's been a great leader um, on campus and also just on my team. And kind of on a smaller scale, I think because we've had those town halls and um, we're so united as an athletics department, I think a lot of teams are going to be working to do their own smaller initiatives. I know on my team, we're gonna have a equity, diversity and inclusion, um, kind of like a breakout group where um, we're gonna try and discuss books and um, different aspects of that weekly, which is pretty exciting because um, I know we've never done that before on my team. So that's just like small changes like that that I think can really go a long way in terms of educating ourselves and trying to be more inclusive and just bettering our programs as a whole. Um, so I'm pretty excited for that. Well, Delaney and Gabe, thank you for giving us your time today. And Kimberly, we're going to turn this back over to you so we can begin the Q&A portion of our conversation today. We're uh, delighted to, um, again, be, be available. And I hope that we'll um, give a lot of space to Gabe and Delaney. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabe. And thank you, Delaney. This was really fantastic. And thank you for joining us today. I have a question for the three of you, and I think it's specifically about you as athletes and also to Vice Chancellor Satterlund, but all three of you mentioned stress and mental health. And I wondered if first it's to the, our student athletes talking about what's it been like, you know, training and conditioning in under these circumstances? Um, how do you stay camp competition ready when you can't compete? And what is, you know, what does this mean for, you know, just student athletes generally for their stress and for mental health. And then to you, um, a, uh, BC Sutherland, thinking about student mental health generally, because this is something that alumni and the alumni board of directors has been thinking about quite a bit. Um, I can start. I think spring was um, definitely extremely difficult from a mental health standpoint. Um, it's really great because UCSD offers us so many um, different resources. So CAPS has different hours for student athletes that can deal more with um, mental health issues that might come up relating to that or just mental health issues in general. Um, and my team has worked really hard on that. So something for me for trying to train during um, spring quarter as um, I'm from LA. So our tracks were closed pretty early on. Most parks were closed and um, there wasn't a lot of space to run. So I ended up um, taping my street uh, based on different measurements and like meters and then I'd run sprints up and down my street which led my neighbors to think I was a little bit crazy um, but some days there's it was really hard to wake up and think okay I'm gonna go run sprints in my street like by myself um, and a really great thing that my team did is every week someone different would send something that motivated them so whether that be a quote or a motivational video or just a text. Um, and seeing that every week really made me feel connected to 25 other girls that were doing the same thing as me in different forms. And then on top of that, just our coaches and trainers are constantly checking in, not only about our physical health, but our mental health as well. And that just means so much during all of this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It does mean a lot having all of that support that's that's there for us. And I and I'll also recognize I think this has been, a, I think, an unprecedented challenge for athletes everywhere. I mean, for most student athletes that are playing at the college level, this has been something that is a central component of their lives. Athletics, I mean, like for at least the past six plus years, it is something they've done for hours a day, nearly every single day of the year. 
and that was stripped away. And so the impact that that has on, I think, student athlete mental health and well-being, it's just, um, it's a really big adjustment. And so it was, it was actually really fortunate. In the spring, we had already been planning on the Triton Athletes Council, a, a, co a combined workshop between our student athlete development committee and our community service committee to do a mental health workshop. We had uh, a guest speaker come and um, she's a TED Talk presenter, Victoria Garrick. She's an advocate for student athlete mental health and she came and we hosted this really fantastic online workshop. It was supposed to be in person originally, I think ideally, but the fact that it was online, I think still worked very well. And um, it was very timely too, because I think it was at a moment where a lot of people really felt like they were struggling to adjust to being online and being away from their friends, being away from their peers, being scared about the world. Um, and so we want to continue with this event, hopefully yearly in some capacity, maybe looking at how to even improve it for next year, but also making sure that, especially right now, we're paying attention to this issue because it's something really important. I think not just for athletes, for everyone, but within our community, this is where we're looking to sort of offer support and be paying attention. I think what I would add to that, and, and first, you know, Delaney and Gabe, thanks for being forthcoming and um, sharing your own experiences also. There, there are some important advancements that have occurred on our campus with regards to student health and well-being. So in January, we actually began the move to a telemedicine model in part to address the, the wait times in our in-person services. And when we moved to remote learning because of the pandemic, and um, you know, a lot of other uh, campuses across the country really were challenged, but we had already been piloting telemedicine. So we, we, ha we had uh, all of our uh, professionals and our scheduling systems ready to go. Uh, all of our CAPS counselors already had iPads for their um, telemedicine sessions, and we'd worked out some of the kinks on the back end. So we have been able to uh, stay on top of um, uh, access needs and we've been able to provide services for our California residents and our students in state. Where we have some challenges are with our students out of state because of licensing requirements in this particular um, issue, but this is a, a, national, a national issue. Um, so we feel uh, fortunate in that regard that our, our telemedicine has been able to um, ensure not just one-on-one -on -one appointments with psychiatrists and psychologists, but also support group availability as well for um, all of our all of our students um, uh, in California, um, and for our out of state students, we have used uh, sort of gatherings and um, uh, community sessions to connect around these issues. So we can also provide some important mental health and well being support. I know that um, I would be remiss if I didn't share that uh, we also have great leadership with an interim executive director who also joined us from UC San Diego health about a year ago, who has helped to ramp up our work, uh, not just in response to student health and well-being needs, but also on the prevention and promotion side. So I, I want to acknowledge Dr. Angela Sosha and also our new Director of Health Promotions, Lisa Joyner, who uh, joined us from um, uh, Virginia Tech and has, has really breathed life into our promotion um, efforts across the board. And, um, you know, this will continue to be a significant issue. We have national data and UC student data and UC San Diego data that reflects an increase in anxiety um, and depression because of the isolation around COVID-19, um, worries for family and loved ones, um, and then also financial, financial pressures uh, for families and loved ones and for our students. And so you know, our work around uh, prevention continues to be critical and the work that we're doing to engage our students uh, though not ideal as we'd like to be in person, but really using remote and virtual um, opportunities to build community uh, will continue to be uh, critical and important and will continue to, to rise to that challenge. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, V.C. Sutherland. In, in fact, just really updating us on what is going on and the changes being made um, in uh, services um, for students, it's really great. Um, I'm going to shift to talking to asking Gabe and Delaney to talk a little bit more about how just um, class time has changed. Are you in, you know, 
hybrid classes? How has your workload changed and the like? What's the experience been like? Delaney, you talked a little bit about that, but I'm, I'm really curious how this has been going for you in terms of course loads and classes. You wanna go? You can go, Gabe. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been an adjustment and I think it's nice hearing, like Delaney mentioned earlier, the side of the faculty and staff because we recognize it's an adjustment for all of us, but it's really weird. And I, to say that it's not is like being dishonest. And I think there's a lot of opportunities that are really kind of exciting about remote learning. There's the there's a lot of different ways to, I think, make online content really engaging. And so I've had a lot of different experiences with some professors trying new things, looking at making, um, for example, all of their lectures pre-recorded. So whatever your schedule looks like, you can just go and access those at any time, come view them when it makes the most sense for you. And then there is no pressure to sort of show up at the same time every day if it's not something that works well with your schedule. And if you might learn better later, then that's actually an improved model. Um, I think there's also something to be said for the ability to just have digital access to everything. Like I transitioned to doing pretty much everything on the laptop and that's irritating in some ways, but also having everything at your fingertips all the time is really convenient. And so professors, I think I've done a good job of being able to catalog all of their resources online and making sure that it's all available to us whenever we need it. So there's pros and cons. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of it um, was definitely adapting um, because you would think that we spend so much time on our screens, our generation, that it'd be easy, but sitting and staring at a screen for a few hours is really, really difficult. So for me, when I had multiple classes in a day, I'd have to kind of switch locations in my house. So I do like one in the kitchen, one in my room, just to get, so that I felt like I was somewhere different um, because you definitely lose that when you're switching between lecture halls, you know, and kind of that engagement side. And then um, I think the other thing for me when it was pre-recorded is as much as I want to just go through the whole lecture, you know, taking a pause, taking 15 minutes and like walking around or just to get a little movement because like you want to be engaged for the whole time. But sometimes for me, I just had to realize, okay, like I need to take a step back and it's okay if it takes a little bit longer if I'm more engaged for the entirety of it. So that was probably the biggest adjustment, but there are a lot of great resources being online and being able to go back through and watch your lectures is, is really helpful, so. Thank you. Here's, here's a quick question for the two of you. Um, I'd like to know uh, what kind of masks are you using as you train? <laughs> um, well, Under Armour has given, is giving each athlete, I think it's three masks and, oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> It has like a nose clip um, because what I found when I was running in other masks that weren't made for athletics is that you end up like breathing in your mask because it's so close to your face. But the ones with the nose clip, it keeps it a little bit further. So when you run, you aren't like sucking the mask in, which can make it really difficult to breathe. Yeah. Thank you, Delaney. For those of us who are going to run the virtual 5K, I'm going to take note of that because I am a long distance runner and I just have not been running because of the mask thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, obviously it, it, it is an expense and really fortunate the athletic department was able to provide these masks with the nose bridge. Um, I would say this is by far the best mask for training that I've used. Um, previously, my go-to had actually been the surgical mask though, just because getting sweaty throughout a workout, like you sort of have the choice of either keep this wet thing on your face or replace it. And I know it's not very eco-friendly, which is why it's, I think, definitely more ideal to have something that is meant for, for training. I really, it's still a mask at the end of the day, but it's a lot better. So Gabe and Delaney, um, this has just been one of those um, it's something that I spoke to a group a, a while ago, Lifequake, something that's come in that's external that we rarely have happen <clears throat> to us once in a lifetime. Um, how do you think this, the, this moment has um, shaped you, shaped how you think about yourself as a student, as an athlete? Have you changed your career goals um, and the like? Yeah, I, I actually, I do. I think this has been a really transformative experience and not just for myself, but I think for many of my peers as well, being at home and not necessarily having the opportunity, but kind of being forced to sort of sit and do a lot of thinking about your life and 
what you value and what you want to continue working on moving forward. Um, actually, I did. I switched my major in the spring <laughs> um, to a different bio major. And so um, I, I took a class and was able to really just spend a lot of time engaging with the content. Um, and so I think it also let me kind of realize what I missed about being in person, which was working in a lab. And um, so fortunately, I've been able to get back to doing research in my lab on campus. But since then, I've really started realizing that like this is something I value a lot and I want to continue with research moving forward. I um, am passionate about it and excited about it. And the, the, the downtime from a pandemic allowed me to realize um, that, that that is, I think, one area where my passion lies. Yeah, something that was really big for me is just kind of realizing how much support I have and um, how many people I care about so deeply and it was pretty difficult because so both of my parents are um, very high risk. So going home um, meant super strict quarantining as it should have been. Um, and I think going home and doing that, there was just no question that I wasn't really gonna leave my house. And that's definitely could be considered difficult, but for me, like knowing how much my parents support me and um, all these great things that I've access to because of them, it was just not really, a question that their health was going to be the main priority and then getting to come back to school but knowing that I'm at this great university I have such a great team and athletics program and knowing that I need to be safe to ensure that my community and these other people are safe as well I think just knowing that there's a bigger purpose out there and um, feeling like very willing to do different to live my life a little differently um, for now so that other people can be safe. I think that's just something that's become more and more important to me. Gabe and Delaney and PCSA uh, Sutherland, thank you so much for sharing um, your time, your information, and you know just how much um, is going on uh, around uh, the pandemic in your lives and in the lives of your peers. So thank you so much. I want to turn it over to um, Associate Vice Chancellor for Alumni Annual uh, Giving and Pipeline Development, Cheryl Harrelson. Thank you. And thank you, Kim. Thank you to all of our speakers, Chancellor Kosla, uh, Kimberly Phillips Boom, Alumni President, Drs. Anderson, Martin, and Schooley, and Vice Chancellor Satterland, and especially to our students, Delaney and Gabe. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. Uh, we know this has been a year like no other. So let's stay connected to one another, stay connected to the university as we remain UC San Diego strong. Please alumni and students join us on tritonsconnect.com uh, where you can experience networking, mentorship, and lots of conversation. Also join us, everyone, for Homecoming at Home. If you go to homecoming.ucsd.edu, you can register for Homecoming. I'm sorry we won't see you in person this year, but there's lots of fun October 19th through the 25th with over 20 events available. Virtual tailgate, a live concert with alumni band Switchfoot, uh, cooking demonstrations, eSport tournaments, and class reunions. In addition, please join us for our next tri Tritons Tackling Series, November 18th at 12 p.m. Uh, it will be our next series with our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, our Chicanx Latinx experience. Again, thank you to all who have joined us for this webinar today. I hope these ongoing events and programs will serve as a reminder that although we are distance, your university remains committed to you, to all of you. Thank you. Be well and be safe.